I, um, I have stayed in Kerala only for three years of my life. I was born in Nigeria. My mother is in the audience here. And uh, it has been a very interesting journey. I studied in North India. I was in Bangalore. So I was exposed to lots of things. I was in UK for a number of years. So it has been a very interesting journey overall. So when the floods happened, we were having the All Kerala Medical Graduate Meeting in Ottawa, in Canada. So for those of you who have followed this, this is a group of all the North Indian, North uh, American physicians of origin from Kerala. We had about 600 people. I can honestly say one of the smartest people that I have worked with are from Kerala. Malayalis are without doubt extremely smart. But we are also our own worst enemies. Paravekyan, Malayalis are the best. I have seen this across different places. But the best workers abroad are all Kerala physicians. So when I was working in UK, there was, um, there was a hospital I was working in. And the nurses would come and tell me, uh, Dr. Shabir, can you come and see this patient? So when you look at the chart, the patient has already been seen by somebody else. So I asked the nurses, uh, why do you want me to see the patient? She said, no, we just want to see what you think. Which is very interesting, because she said, we want to see what you think. One of the greatest pleasures we have in life is the ability to think. If something comes in the media, we follow it blindly. None of us really think. We have lost the art of thinking. So if somebody comes and tells you, this man is an alcoholic, we believe them blindly. We don't spend time to find out whether he lost his wife, whether his family died. None of us ask what the basis for it is. We've become very judgmental. It is not bad to be judgmental, because sometimes you have to be judgmental. But it actually erodes everything that you do as a human being. Now the only thing that prevents us or makes us different from acting in a very primal manner is this. And there is only one process that slows it down. It's if you're mindful. So Buddha has said, you don't feel your feet until you touch the ground. It's only when your feet come in contact with the ground that you become aware of the foot. So for example, right now, how many of you are aware of your hands? If you hold your hands like this, you're not aware of it. But I want you to touch the hand rest and feel your hand rest. Try it. And all of a sudden you become aware of your hands. It's the same thing with thinking. You don't become aware of thinking unless you're forced to think. So if you're in an exam and the examiner asks you a question, your mind goes blank because you are on the spot. It causes anxiety. So here's the issue. We all go through life every day. We think we're very intelligent. Everybody likes to feel you're intelligent. It's not a bad thing. But we all have limits. We all have limits to what we can do. What we can't do is what we rarely pay attention to. So the smart man is the one who pays attention to what he does not know. Sometimes you find it hard to sleep. It's very simple. If you pick up everything you see on the road, you're only going to reach Statue Junction before your arms are full and you can't move anymore. But yet we allow our minds to be filled with a lot of garbage. We're making constant phone calls, we're talking to people, we're giving opinions, you read something that is emotionally driven. How can you go back and sleep? Insomnia is one of the most common problems in Kerala today. There are many people who can't sleep. So what do they use because they can't sleep? They turn to alcohol. Alcohol is something that's used very commonly now. The other thing that's used is cannabis. So what happens is over a period of time, you have not been able to learn how to cope with difficulties in life. So like the guy who's walking from here before he reaches statue and he has all the garbage in his hand, Unless you learn how to throw it away, you will have a lot on your mind. Even a Chinese varanada, the monkey brain. So the monkey brain is chattering all the time. Constantly it is going. It's jumping from one thing to another. Unless you learn how to control the monkey brain, 
you will constantly be driven. So for example, right now you're all tired, you probably were busy with different activities, work, traffic, you have to go home, you're wondering what is this guy saying. There's lots of things going on in your mind. To slow your mind down, the only thing you can do is to be mindful. And fortunately as human beings, we don't realize the value of anything until you lose it. It's a very sad state of affairs. So for many people who lost things because of the flood, all of a sudden they came to the reality that everything that accumulated was only a physical comfort. Nothing was of mental comfort. So there was a WhatsApp video, I don't know if you saw this recording, what is three Barayana? about all the things that she lost. She said, Viti Poipum, there's water, everything is destroyed, lots of dishes, so many things. She said, when the flood was there and I didn't have to think about it, actually my mind was calmer. I didn't have to worry about the saris I was wearing, I didn't have to worry about the jewelry I was wearing. She said it was all unnecessary. So it's only when she lost it and there was so much distress that she became aware of what she had. Just like all of us, life is so short, we forget. We get caught up in fights, you're angry with people, and before you know it, you're 90 years old, you're about to go, we don't know when we're going. You develop a knee problem, and then you suddenly start saying, oh, my knees are hurting. Till that time, we never valued it. So when I told you to feel the handle, the only reason I asked you to do that was to recognize that unless you value what you have, you will never respect what you have. It's called being grateful. Resilience is the ability to cope with loss. When you have loss, when you're suffering, somebody rejects you, you develop a sense of resilience. How to cope with that loss? Coping with sense of loss comes with strength of community. Human beings are amazing people. Most of us don't communicate. We don't even listen. We have become so poor in listening, we think we know. So when people come to you with the distress, we rarely pay attention to it. None of us pay attention. We like to assume that people who are very rich have all the answers. That because they are successful, they are very smart. The floods in Kerala proved that whether you are rich or poor, you are a PhD holder or SSLC dropout, you are all the same. None of us are different. So in the eyes of the one who created us, we are all the same. There's no difference between us. But we create these artificial silos. If you choose to break it, you build a friendship. If you don't have stress, you will never learn how to cope with difficulty in life. So stress is not a bad thing. Too much stress is a problem. So how do you draw the line between stress and too much stress? Too much stress is when you find it interferes with your sleep, your appetite, you become irritable, your mood is low. Now, there is a new school of thought growing to maximize how you function. So you can all be sitting here, you're all paying attention, but your mind will drift, mind will come back, mind will drift, it'll come back. When you do mindfulness, you realize that that's what your mind is going to do, the Chinese monkey brain. To train your brain, you need to recognize that your mind is always going to wander. So if you look at the neighbors and think they have a new Audi car or they have something else, you will lose the value of what you have. And the problem is, the only time you realize what you have is when you have a disaster. Why do we wait for something to go wrong before you realize the value of what you have? We live in very busy, busy times now, very, very busy times. Everybody is in a hurry, but nobody knows why. Our priority in life today is to be grateful for what we have. See, none of you have an oxygen tank. None of you have dementia. You all walked and came for the function. You could think independently. What happens if you lose that? What happens tomorrow if you lose the ability to remember? One of the most important things in coping with loss is being grateful for what you have so you enjoy it thoroughly. When somebody dies in the family, we all feel very sad. We forget that none of us actually knew which family we were going to be born in. I can ask any one of you, I mean, did you know that she was going to be your mother? No, 
You didn't, right? You don't know who your children are going to be. But we assume when we get these people, they are ours and we keep them. It's not like that. They can go anytime. The only way you can reduce distress when you have loss is to be grateful for what you have. So the first thing and the key thing is a recognition of what you have. So now I'm going back to the Upanishad. There's a very beautiful shloka that I mentioned to you. So in this shloka, Nachiketa is asking Yamaraja, he's asking him a beautiful question. This is a 10-year-old boy. Hmm? He says, when I die, will I be or won't I be? Did you get it? Will I be or won't I be? This is, a, this is fundamentally a, a, an incredible question because it's very existential and it's very, very uh, root. Adhada, will I be who I was or will I just disappear? So Yamaraja was confused. He didn't know what to do because this is a very bright guy. So he stated, he said, no, no, even the gods don't know the answer. So the Nachiketa said, then you should tell me the answer. So for those of you who want to read about this, there's a very good explanation given by Swami Krishnananda. It's beautiful. Some of the others are very confusing. His is very simple and it's a nice, nice thing to read. So then the boy says, uh, I want you to give me the answer. Now Yamaraja is even more upset because he's thinking, what do I tell this boy? He's very intelligent. So he says, no, 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 you should ask for money, ask for wealth, uh, ask for women. So the boy says, okay, but even that will come to an end. See his intelligence. Today, we lead life looking for all material pleasures. None of us ask that question. We don't. We go from day to day to day. How many of us actually ask that question? What is going to become of me? So then he says, he gives an example of the soul, the mind, the senses, and the stimuli. So the example is the charioteer, the person who's riding the chariot. Okay, So he owns it. So the charioteer is the body. He's the person riding it. This person has a brain. He has a soul. The reins of the chariot are what controls it. Right? He has control over the horses. But the horses are the senses. The pathways are all the stimuli. Whether it's money, pleasure, whatever, you, whatever it is. Today, we have become so preoccupied with everything on the ground. You see the connection with the old Chinese thing? It's amazing how wisdom is there across, but none of us read it. So the Chinese talk about the monkey brain. The same thing is being said in the Upanishad, but expounded in a manner that you can understand better. It says, you have all these things there. If you don't take control of your senses, then you have lost control of your own ability to purify your soul, because you're giving into all the smaller things. Now, the problem with this is, when you talk about buddhi, our understanding of buddhi is actually superficially translated into intellect. There is a big difference between the intellect and the mind. So this clarifies it again. It says the intellect should control the mind. Today, when we read the newspaper, how many of us use intellect? Almost zero. We go from one story to another. We rarely make the effort to understand what it is that the horses are doing. What, what is my sense taking in? So the example I gave you of us picking all this garbage and things like that on the way is the same thing that's going on because we are not controlling what goes in. For most people who suffered at the time of distress, the people who will suffer the most are the people who never valued what they have. They are the ones who will have the most grief. So the counseling centers they did, grief reaction is going to be one of the worst things. So sometimes one of the best things to do in, di in, uh, in a time of disaster is not to wait for the disaster. So before we are struck with a calamity, it is the responsibility of each and every one of us to value what we have, to be grateful for what we have. There's no point in envying your neighbor because you don't know what problems he has. But we also need to realize that when you have stress, it is not necessarily a bad thing. Because the monkey brain, the horses we are talking about, unless you take control of it, it will keep doing the same thing over and over and over again until you feel you have no control over it. In times of distress, always remember, there is no quick solution. 
quick solutions never give good results. It can be very painful and traumatic. You can face a lot of turmoil, but none of this will break you as much as rejection by people. In a nutshell, the best things to do when you are worried is to realize you're not as bad off as so many other people. Man-made disasters are much worse than natural disasters because natural disasters tackles everybody. And as I said, whether you're a PhD or a SSLC dropout, we all face the same thing. It does not distinguish between who's rich or poor. We just need to realize that this should be a learning curve for all of us. As a society, Kerala is very strong. And the very fact that they've raised so much of money is amazing. So we are gifted, but we can't throw it away by destroying our own lives because of anger and resentment. So make sure we are prepared before the disaster strikes. And when it does, we are grateful for what we had. We are grateful for the help we have. And don't worry about what you lost. Don't worry about that. Be grateful for what you haven't lost. Thank you.